this I read this this morning about four this morning uh, Jeremiah 39 starting with verse 15 and talking about the fall of Jerusalem and this is when when the Babylonians came in and Jeremiah had been prophesying and while Jeremiah had been uh, confined in the courtyard of the guard the word of the Lord came to him and said go tell Ebed Melech the Cushite which is an Ethiopian this is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says I am about to fulfill my words against the city words concerning disaster not prosperity at that time they will be, be fulfilled before your eyes but listen to this but I will rescue you on that day declares the Lord you will not be given into the hands of those who you fear <coughs> Excuse me. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. All we have to do in the next several months is trust in the Lord. 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 And, uh, so I don't know what's going to happen in the next few months, but um, I tell you what, I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to be afraid. And I'm not putting another stinking mask on. Yeah. Yes? On the 15th, that, uh, that evening is the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. Yes. And, uh, up the 19th? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, some well, maybe they're doing it on the 15th. I'm not sure. Right. Anyway, uh, up at the column, uh -huh. on the 15th, yeah. at 7 o'clock at night, uh, they're gathering. And they're going to blow shofars? Yes. Okay. And pray, and um, Pastor Marty from the community church is from the state <clears throat> and so they'll be praying some worship. And is that with Pete? Pa uh, Pastor Pete? Or no, a different group? Well, well no. Pastor Pete would probably be there. Yeah. Because it was... Uh, Julie that was telling us about it. What day is that of the week? Thursday. Okay. All right. Mary, I'm shaking her head. Yes. I'll be in New York. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, as many as we... It's a Friday? As many as can should go to that. All right. So, um, I just want to encourage you, just trust God, Okay. Amen? Amen. So, uh, elements of powerful prayer. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of James. James 5, 16 through 18. And uh, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and uh, the earth produced crops. And then 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today, O oh God. And Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We need your help. God, we need your help. And Lord, I know that uh, uh, evil men would like to, uh, like to shut down the church, O oh God. Would, Lord, would like to rewrite the Bible, O oh God. And uh, Lord, completely uh, obliviate us. But we trust in you, O oh God. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, O oh God. And we humble ourselves, O oh God, and we cry out to you. Lord, forgive us of our sins in this nation, O oh God. Forgive us of our sins, O oh Lord. So we just ask that you would come down and heal our land. And Lord, uh, just like the word of Jeremiah to the Cushite, O oh God. Lord, we trust in you. We trust in you. 
And so, Father, we just ask that you would anoint this word today. Oh, God, let there be an open heaven between you and these people. That divine revelation would come straight from their throne room, straight to their hearts, oh, God. And, Lord, I ask that you would anoint me this day. Hide me behind the cross. And may every word out of my mouth, oh, God, come straight from you and not my heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of testimonies here. First of all, I'm going to start off with a question. Why pray? Well, I'll tell you why pray. A couple of weeks ago, we were kind of, we want to redo this ramp out here. Uh, so uh, Bobby and others who are wheelchair bound uh, can come through the front doors easier. And uh, it was Tom, uh, one of our board members, a uh, genius man. All right. You're a genius, Tom. All right, everybody tell him he's a genius, he's a genius. <laughs> but he designed a, a ramp, ADA, stuff like that. Uh, used to work for ODOT, drew the plans out, took them, to, uh, we got a contractor. So we prayed, they said it would take maybe 60, to 60 days to get it approved. We don't want to wait 60 days. And so we prayed one Sunday and then we got word that it was approved. And then uh, we had a hard time getting a hold of the contractor, getting on his schedule, so we prayed again. They're going to do it this Wednesday. Woohoo! Why pray? Why pray? Things happen when we pray. Probably one of the most dramatic things in my life that I saw God answer. My dad, uh, when I was in junior high and high school, he started building this massive building. And uh, a church. A church. He was building a brand new church. It was like probably 10 times larger than the little church that we were in. And as he started building it, well, if you remember in the late 70s, if some of you, how many were, uh, how many remember the late 70s? All right. Like, all right, a few of us. Yeah, some of you weren't even born. And uh, so uh, what happened was there was, in construction, you know how, like, there's, it was a housing crisis, and it was it was miserable. It was just as bad as the one that was in uh, ninety. What was that? No, uh, two thousand eight. And um, so, so uh, we had my dad was in the middle of this building project, and uh, nine families moved out of the area that was belonged to our church. Not because they didn't like our church, because they didn't have a job. And they moved to other places. And so my dad was, you know, he was concerned. And then we, and this was back in the day when interest rates were like, uh, they were crazy. They were like 12, 11 percent, 14. Um, we had a second on our house that was 22 and uh, percent uh, interest rate. And we had this, uh, we had this big, I started working for my dad. And this is before Janice and I got married. And we had this guy that was at, at our church. Um, he started going to Northwest Nazarene uh, University, but he was an AG pastor. And he was kind of helping us out. And we had this $10,000 balloon payment that had to be made by Friday. And we'd scraped up every penny we had in the church. And uh, I was working for a $50 gas allowance. That's, and I was straight out of Bible school. Per month. Uh, per month. Okay. Per month. And uh, so um, Dave Long said, you know what? We're going to pray about this. And my dad, he did this old school like thermometer. He, he liked this kind of stuff. And uh, he, he got a, a, a piece of like uh, paneling, you know, and turned it backwards and painted it. And they had this big ribbon. And so it was like a thermometer, you know, and as the money went up, they would pull the ribbon in the back. And so he had that. And so we had one, one week to go before this. is. And so Dave Long told me, he said, hey, I'm going to come to your house in the morning. I'm going to pick you up at six in the morning. We're going to go down to the church and we're going to pray. 
And I said, are you sure? <laughs> and so he would come at six in the morning. First, first day I was ready to get up and I was ready to go down to the church. You know, second morning, I was, I was kind of ready. And then by the third day, I was like, oh, man, I don't know if I can. And he just, I could hear his car out. And then pretty soon he came to the door, knocked on that. So I crawled out of bed at six and we got in his a little truck and we drove down to the church. And we got down there and we were just the only ones in the sanctuary. And we were praying. And as we were praying, we were praying, God, meet this need of $10,000. That was a lot of money in 1983. That's a lot of money. And uh, so we're praying. And then one, one morning, Dave got this just like, a, he saw it in the spirit. He saw that it was like a big old giant. And he just got mad, and he just reached up there and smacked it in the spirit. As he was praying, and I, God gave him a gift of faith. That Friday, a check in the mail came for $10,000 from a former board member that had moved to Alaska and started a fish business, and he tithed off of that. Praise God. Praise God. I, I know that God can answer prayer. You know, uh, uh, Kings, 1 Kings 18, uh, 41 through 42. Let me read this story. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, eat, and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. And uh, or caramel, one of those sounds good. I'm getting hungry. And he bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. And then go look towards the sea. He told his uh, servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing there. He said seven times. Elijah said, "Go back." And the seventh time, the servant reported, "A cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea." So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, and a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. Elijah was a powerful praying man. He prayed, and it did not rain for three and a half years. And it did not rain until he prayed again. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. God answers prayer. Some prayers are answered and others are not. Luke twenty-two forty-two. 42, it says Jesus, and we talked about this several weeks ago. Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and he, right before his crucifixion. And he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Jesus knew that the Father can do absolutely anything. Absolutely anything. But he prefaced it with this, is nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Several years ago, God was in the process of moving me up here to the Northwest. How many can say, well, praise God for that, or you want me to go back to California, all right? So, but, but uh, as I'm glad to be out of California. It's killing my wife, but I'm really glad to be out of there. But as, as uh, we, uh, we were in this situation where we had moved out of our church, and we were supposed to move into this property, and uh, they uh, they reneged on the deal. Well, they what they did was it was the Southern Baptist, and they were closing the church down, and they offered us a lease for the empty building. Well, the disgruntled people in the church went to a judge and got a uh, court order to stop the sale of the building or the lease of it. And all of a sudden, we had turned in our lease in the property we were at, and we couldn't move into the other one. So they moved us in. They, they had a lot of empty churches. So they moved us into another empty church. And we thought about this. 
And I said, well, this is a better church. I'll take this church. And so I started to pray. And we could meet there on Saturday nights and pray. And uh, so Saturday, or every morning, we gathered at 6 in the morning. We started praying, a, a group of us from the church. And we're praying, God, give us this building. And uh, then on Saturday night, we were praying. And this gal, she was just so burdened. Her name was Sylvia. She was just bawling and crying and crying. And, uh, and I'm going, oh, man, what in the world? Uh, so... Uh, I had this feeling, and uh, God gave her a word, and one of the ladies in the church said, well, Sylvia, what, what did God give you? And it said, she said, she said, the word God gave me was no amount of sacrifice. And I thought, ah, what does that mean? That's from, that's from 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 3, 14. Remember, uh, God had uh, brought a word, Samuel brought a word against Elijah as a boy, that he was going to bring judgment on, upon Elijah and his sons, and he said no amount of sacrifice was going to change his mind. Sometimes our prayers are not answered because it goes against the sovereignty of God and God's will. But other times... God wants to answer a lot of our prayers and we are not asking enough. I believe that. We are not asking enough. Um, so, uh, three good biblical reasons to pray. And Janice, I don't know if it ran off or not, but I have handouts that are on the printer. Oh, in your office? In my office, yes. And uh, maybe Van, you could go help her and pass those out if I, if they print it up. Um, uh, three bi good biblical reasons to pray. The first one is we are commanded to pray. We are commanded to pray by God. Uh, look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face. First Chronicles sixteen eleven, and then Psalms one hundred five four says, "Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always." And by the prophets, Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. And then Amos 5, 4, and 6. This is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. And then uh, seek the Lord and live. Or he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. He will, it will devour and Bethel will be no and will have no one to quench it. And by the apostles, Ephesians 6, 17 through 18. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. And Ephesians 6, 18. And then Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray continually. And then Jesus commanded us to pray. He said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Matthew 18, 1. Um, <coughs> then Jesus told his disciples this parable. To show them that they should always pray and not give up. And then John 16, 24. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. The second reason to pray is prayer. The link between God's blessing and power and the fulfillment of his promises. Luke eleven fifteen through 13. And uh, we're, remember the story about... Uh, that Jesus told the parable and he said well suppose you have some guy that uh, uh, you know is is two guys living side by side and one guy has uh, friends that are traveling from afar and they come in the middle of the night and he has no bread to set before them what does the neighbor do he gets up and he goes over to his neighbor's house and he knocks on the door in the middle of the night and if you know anything about um, the Jewish culture in the time of Jesus, um, at nighttime, they brought everything into the house. They brought the cow, the chicken, the goats, everything came into the house with the kids. And everybody was put in, and they locked the house up. 
But all of a sudden, the neighbor comes over there and he keeps knocking on the door. He said, hey, I've got friends. My in-laws came from out of town and I have no bread. And what did Jesus say? He said, the guy will get up and he will give him bread. Luke 11, 8 out of the King James says, yet because of his importunity, the NIV says boldness. Luke 11, 8 says persistence. And ESV, impudence. And the New Living Translation, shameless persistence. If you look at impudent, it, uh, what does it mean? It means bold with contempt or disregard. Unbla unblushingly forward, impertinent, wanting, mod uh, wanting modesty, shameless, saucy. Importunity is a word we don't use. It's an old English word. But it means the quality of being importunate, pressing or uh, pertinacious solicitation, urgent request, incessant or frequent application, troubling, troublesome pertinacity. How many of you have been standing in line at the grocery store and there is a three-year-old with, with her mother right in front of you and she wants a candy bar and she with importunity says, I want that candy bar. Can I have that candy bar? Please give me that candy bar. I'm going to die in the next few minutes if I don't get that candy bar. Please give me that candy bar. That is importunity. She doesn't care. That three-year-old does not care how many people are in that store. She has no shame. When it comes to asking God, we should have no shame. Amen? The third reason, God ordained you to be involved in his redemptive process. Matthew 9, 38, out of the New American Standard. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send labors into his harvest field. I want you to, that should be on, that's going to be on my prayer list this week. We need labors into the harvest field. How many can say amen? Some of the people that you need to get saved are some of the people that we need to harvest. And they will be our labors. We tried everything. The only thing we have left is to pray. That sometimes is people's attitude towards prayer. The Christian's most powerful resource is communion with God through prayer. The results are often greater uh, than we thought were possible. Some people see prayer as a last resort to be tried when all else fails. This approach is backward. Prayer should come first. Because God's power is infinitely greater than ours, it only makes sense to rely on it, especially because God encourages us to do so. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Harley Allen is a great pastor, and uh, I went to uh, a pastor's meeting a long time ago uh, down in California. And uh, Harley, I think he's pushing almost 90, but he's a great big guy. And uh, he talked about how that he went to some place like Thailand or something. It's kind of like being out on, you know, uh, Oysterville or something, you know, because it's at the end of the peninsula, you know. It, um, it may not be the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> right? So he... He, he goes to this, this little orphanage in, in Thailand or something. He said, he, had, he said the same thing. It may not be the end of the world, but you can see it from there. He said, I learned something from those missionaries who had absolutely nothing. Sometimes when, when we need something, what do we do? We call on MasterCard. We get out our, 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 you know, our credit card. But he said they didn't have a credit card and they would pray and God would answer their prayers. Don't let, when you're in, when you need something from God, when you need, let prayer be the first thing you come to. Not the last thing. 
James 5, 16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The New American Standard says, number two, realize prayer does change things. The Lord heard Elijah cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. First Kings 17, 22. There's three miracles in chapter 17 that uh, manifest God's glory and his love. Uh, Elijah, in the first six verses, Elijah was fed by ravens. I guess if you're hungry enough, you will eat a cheeseburger from a raven. And then uh, when the creek dried up and the raven stopped bringing food, God uh, told him to go to Zarephath and there would be a widow there that would provide for him. And so the story 7 through 16 uh, he came into town and he found a woman who was gathering a few sticks and, and uh, he said, woman, can you, can you fix me a pancake? And she said, I have just a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And I tell you what, I have one little boy and, and I'm going to make one little pancake. We're going to divide it and then we're going to decide to start. And Elijah said, this is the word of the Lord to you. If you make me a pancake first out of that flour and that olive oil, you know what? God will provide. And what happened? Until that famine was over, that little, that flour jar never ran out of flour. And the olive oil kept pouring, kept pouring. You think that, you think that's just a, a, a little thing that just wouldn't happen with anybody? I, 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 when I was a kid, I heard missionaries that were down in South America and they talked about during a famine, they had a bag of beans that they fed the whole village from. The beans, the bag of beans never ran out until the famine was over. The third thing that happened was the little boy's son, the widow's son, died and he was raised from the dead. Verses 17 through 24. God's power and love are active on my behalf. James is talking about Elijah and how his great prayer life. God's power and love are active on our behalf. I love him. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed uh, God. He is, faith, he is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Psalm 34, 6 says, In my desperation I prayed, and the Lord listened, and he saved me from all of my troubles. I am, a called, I am called according to his purposes. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to the, his purpose for them. Romans 8, 28. The second thing here under this point is your prayer has energy. James stresses the effectual nature of a fervent prayer of a righteous man. Although a literal translation in the Greek phrase is awkward and different versions vary from their different their translations. The basic idea is the supplication, having energy. Those Greek that Greek word and that phrase in there means that our prayers have energy. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful. The effective prayer is characterized by earnestness fervency and energy and is illustrated in the case of the following verses uh, provided. Elijah was a man. James 5, 17. It says that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. For example, the Amplified says, Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have with feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours. Point number three is this. Realize your nature does not limit God's ability. Your nature does not limit God's ability. You might be thinking here, well, pastor, I'm not a very good Christian. Well, that doesn't matter. Elijah was no better, no greater than you, and God answered tremendous prayers of his. His nature 
was no different. Your nature does not limit God's ability. One of my favorite stories Mark Rutland tells about is he was doing this uh, charismatic conference or something over a weekend, and he had a terrible case of gout. Anybody ever have gout? Oh, yeah, it really hurts. I've never had it. My sympathies for those who had it. My dad had it. My uncle had it. Um, just, you know, he had it down in his foot, and he was, he'd been teaching and, and things, and it was one of these churches that had, like, off to the side, they had a whole bunch of sliding glass doors, and when it came dinner time uh, or lunch time, they would open up the sliding doors, and, and everybody in the sanctuary would go into this fellowship hall, and they would have lunch or dinner. And so he was teaching, and he said it had his foot propped up on a chair, and as he had it up on a chair, it was really hurt. Well, the cook had a Down syndrome son, and he was like, you know, older, but he acted like a child, like most Down syndrome children. And, uh, but he dressed up as a cowboy. His name was Jimmy. He had a cowboy hat and he had a cap gun. And he would uh, crawl around in the chairs and the pews, and every once in a while he'd jump up and he would go bang, bang. And Mark Rutherford would go, oh, and almost fall off his chair. But he had his foot propped up. And he snuck up and, and you know, Jimmy would jump up, bang, bang. Oh, you shot me again. Well, he came up to me and, and uh, he asked him, he said, hey, you want to you wanna come play with me? He said, oh, Mark Rutherford said, Brother Mark doesn't feel very good. I just, you know, I, I'm really hurt. And uh, this this Down syndrome uh, Down syndrome boy says, uh, "Let me pray for you." And he put his hand out and he said, "Jesus, touch Brother Mark's foot, heal it." And then he jumped up and goes, "Bang bang, you're dead." <laughs> Immediately. His foot was healed. If God can use a Down syndrome boy to heal someone, how much more could he use you? Your nature does not limit God's ability to answer prayer. Elijah was no better than you. In spite of the greatness of Elijah, was subject, he was subject to the same feelings, the liable, same weakness as we all experience. Effectual, that is, miracle-producing prayer is not limited to a certain few, such as apostles or prophets. All believers can pray for one another with the same results. I, had a, I have a friend... And he went to go hear, uh, you know, I encouraged him, him and his wife to go hear someone, uh, uh, you know, uh, speak. And this guy's well known for his miracle ministry and healing ministry. And uh, the guy that was doing the, the, it was at a full gospel businessman's meeting. He told my friends and everybody there, he said, well, you can go pray. And my friend was a little confused. He said, well, I don't have the gift of healing. You don't need the gift of healing. You just need to pray. God is no respecter of persons. If he used Elijah, Elijah was, no, was nobody special or nobody greater or different than you and me. Um, Acts 10, uh, 34 says... Uh, of, of the truth I perceive that there is no respecter of persons. Acts 10 34 out of the NIV says God does not show favoritism. Uh, the New American Standard God does not show partiality. Be encouraged. What he has done for others he will do for you. The second thing is all believers can pray with one another with this for the, and expect the same results. Don't be intimidated by others and their great testimony. Friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings just like you. 
Paul said to, um, I forgot what town it was in Acts, but uh, they healed a man, and uh, uh, this is where he got stoned and beat up and drug out of the town, but they, were, they thought he was a god and started sacrificing bulls to, to him and uh, Silas. And uh, so, uh, but he, they tore his clothes and said, hey, we're just, we're just regular guys like you. You don't have to have, you don't have to be someone special uh, before God hears you. Just be with, uh, just be, just be with a childlike faith. That was probably Barnabas, wasn't it? Anyway, um, you can check it out, Acts 14. Expect God to do something. Galatians 6, 8. The one who sows uh, to please the sinful nature, from that nature he will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will re reap eternal life. Often people think only a certain person can pray for their need. But God will hear your prayer just as he does others. James 5, 17, as we continue on in this passage. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Follow the five keys to effective praying. Um, Gary Collins, my dad, uh, used to have a tape of his, and he talked about how when somebody's getting married, uh, it's like when you go into a harbor, and there is uh, buoys out in the harbor that you have to line up to get into the channel. And he said, uh, it's like when you're, when you're thinking about getting married, he said you have, you have to line up these three or five uh, buoys. There is, you have to have the same faith. And uh, the pastor has to feel good about the relationship. Your family has to approve of it. Your church family has to think good about the relationship. Your friends should approve of who you're going to get married. If those five don't line up, I suggest that you don't get married. All right? And some of you are saying, I wish you would have told me that 20 years ago. <laughs> In the same way, here are five buoys you need to line up to have answered prayer. Number one is have a sincere, true faith. Um, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. Uh, Mark eleven twenty four, Mark nine twenty three. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Hebrews ten twenty two. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full of insurance, having our hearts sprinkled and cleansed from our uh, from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. James one six. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And James 5, 15, and the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person what? Amen. Well, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, it will be forgiven. Number two, it's got to be made in the name of Jesus. John 14, 13, and I will do whatever you ask, what? In my name. So that the Son may bring glory to the God, and you may ask me for anything in my name, and what? I will do it. Number three, according to God's perfect will. Uh, John, 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. Matthew 16. Uh, 610, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number four, you must be in God's will if you expect him to hear and answer us. Matthew 16, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. 1 John 3, 32, and receive from him anything you ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And number five, you must be persistent. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And verse 8, everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Um, 
uh, out of the Amplified, keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking uh, reverently, seeking, finds. Uh, and to him who uh, keeps on knocking, the door will be open. Like many things in our life, not only do we, they need to do certain things, but you need to uh, avoid some things. James 5, 18, the, our last verse. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. Our no, fifth point is this. Avoid uh, two teachings that undermine prayer. Um, before I give you those last two, I want to just tell you this. I have a stack of index cards um, that I have somewhere. <laughs> I lost them, <laughs> but I... But I I have a, one card, and I copied something from Dr. Cho. And uh, these these are my little prayer cards. And sometimes when I I need and I I misplaced them, and I don't know where they're at. So pray that I find them because I I've, I've had them for years. How is authority over Satan exercised? Our fight is with Satan, not flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Ephesians six twelve. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world and their spiritual forces in heavenly realms. When you see the dark things that are coming upon this land, know this, that we fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight against powers and principalities and rulers over this dark world. Though uh, through uh, Christ's death and resurrection, we have the keys to death and the grave. Jesus has given us authority. All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28:18. All authority. And then Jesus has all authority on earth, but he Christ shares that authority with believers. Luke 10:19. Read this with me. Read this out loud. Luke 10:19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So Jesus was given authority, and he shares that authority with us. And we are fighting not flesh and blood, but uh, principalities and powers. Uh, his authority, we, with his authority, we can uh, bind the forces of Satan in people, in communities, and nations. Our prayers are powerful. You know, this uh, World Economic Forum and the UN and uh, whatever they plan on doing, we have the power, we are given the authority and the power to bind those things and call them that, that call things that are not as though they were and they will become. Amen? So when you see these dark forces coming, then what you need to do is get up and begin to bind in the name of Jesus these things and say, you are not going to make these things happen. The effectiveness of prayer is based on the blood covenant through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So you, here's what happens is when you begin to pray in the spirit and you and you begin to pray and you begin to bind and lose something. Satan is comes to you right then and there. And what does he do? He begins to ridicule you. He brings up every negative thought you can think of. You could be praying, and as you're praying, God will all, all of, all, not God, but Satan will bring this to your memory. Remember back when you were five years old and your father didn't give you milk and cookies when you asked it? Wasn't that mean of your dad? You should be really ticked off at your dad. Now, why did that thought come right then? Say, I bind that thought in the name of Jesus. Find every negative, accusing, self-depleting word that comes to your mind because legal right has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Our effectiveness as prayer is based on the blood covenant through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The two things that you can't fall for 
is you're not a victim of fate is the first thing fate is believing that everything happens to us as fixed and unchangeably in advance long before it occurs I was talking to a relative the other day and he just said well you know some things happen because they just happen and there's nothing we can do about it until Jesus comes again I'm going to pray about everything because I know that prayer changes everything. Prayer changes things. Before Jesus comes, I've got some people I need to get saved. Do you? You are not a victim of fate. The other thing is, is uh, God deals with you not by absolute determinism but by divine providence. I think it's divine providence. God interacts with chill, his children and responds to the prayers of the righteous. Your prayer and faith in God do cause many good things to happen that otherwise would not happen. I think, I think if Dave Long hadn't drugged me out of bed at 6 in the morning when I was 23 years old or 22 years old or however old I was and we went and, we went and prayed, I, I don't think that $10,000 would have come in. But God in His divine providence has given you the authority by the blood of Jesus and by the proclamation of Jesus himself. I have given you all authority to stomp on snakes and scorpions. Are we going to run outside and find some scorpions and stomp on them or snakes? He's not talking about that. He's talking about demons and devils of hell. We can stomp on them. It is his divine providence that you pray and get involved in what he's trying to do in this day, in this age. Your prayers and faith in God do cause many good things to happen that other would otherwise not occur. My good friend, one of my best friends from junior high, when I was in junior high, I used to witness to him and he, he came to the Lord. One time I was talking to him, I said, uh, how did you come to the Lord? He goes, you know, when I was a little kid, um, you know, maybe four or five. We had a neighbor that invited us to vacation Bible school. And I believe that he came because a neighbor prayed for him that he would get saved. I believe that every one of you here today are here because somebody prayed for you. I'm here today because of the prayers of my mother and Tammy too. <laughs> Janice is here because of the prayers of her mother. If I had a if I had a life message, I guess this uh, this would be it. I I believe in prayer. I believe we should pray. Because things happen when we pray. And you, you can, you're just as good as Elijah when it comes to praying. I'm going to ask this question in every service. How's your relationship with the Lord? How many could say, you know what, my, 
My relationship with the Lord is not where it should be. But would you please pray for me? Is there anyone this morning that would like? Yeah, we could always use more of God. But let's start bringing in people who really need Jesus. <coughs> Purple's not my favorite color. Color. <laughs> Just kidding. I like purple. But anyway. Yes, we want we want the we want the chairs to be filled. Here's my second thing I just want to ask. How many would pray this? Say, dear Jesus, help me realize that when I pray, good things happen do happen that would otherwise not occur. Increase my faith in your faithfulness and divine providence. In Jesus' strong name. How many would like to make that their prayer this morning? I don't know if that little prayer is on the bottom of your sheet there, but uh, would you stand with me and just pray? If you want God, I, I just my desire is that God would raise up prayer warriors in this church, intercessors. Because we need this world to change. Mm -hmm. So do me a favor. As you close your eyes, put your hands up just a little bit. Just like this. Like you're receiving something from the Lord. Father God, we just come to you and we ask in the name of Jesus. Help us to realize that when we pray, good things happen that would not otherwise occur. God, all of us are here today because somebody prayed for us. Somebody cared enough that they shared the gospel for us. Somebody prayed for us. And we're here because of the prayers of others. Lord, help us to, to do the same. Help us to pray for our loved ones and our lost ones, O oh God. And Lord, I pray that you would increase our faith. Increase our faith in, our, in your faithfulness. You have been a faithful God and divine providence, O oh God. We are not here by accident, but Lord, you have directed our steps to this point in our lives. And so Lord, I just ask that you would raise up prayer warriors in our church, men and women who will intercede until heaven opens up. And God, that we change this world. We are asking these things in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 So the next time you get into trouble, don't reach for your wallet first. Pray. Pray. Amen? Amen. Amen.